This week on Merchants of Change, we talked with Victor Karpenko. Victor was a football and track athlete in high school before he went on to sprint and play rugby at Cal State Chico. Today, Victor is a channel sales manager at 5.9. 5.9 is a leading provider of cloud contact center software. Here he is, Victor Karpenko. I'm J.R. Butler, co-founder of The Shift Group, and you're listening to Merchants of Change. This is a podcast about transferring the skills and behaviors we acquire as athletes into being a professional technology salesperson. Each week, we'll introduce you to a top performer who will help us understand how they became professional merchants of change. What's up, kid? How we doing, Victor? Doing good. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much for joining us, man. Um, Absolutely. I think uh, I think you had originally reached out on on LinkedIn when I had launched the company, so I'm really excited to to speak with you. As you know, um, most of the guests on our show and who we work with have been high level athletes who have made the transition into into sales, right? And I, I yeah. think. We all believe that, you know, athletes are uniquely positioned to be really successful. And your story is guys like you and your story are exactly why I started the company. Um, So I'd love to kind of start with, we like to start with your athletic career. Um, Obviously, you played football, ran track in high school, and then you went on to sprint and play rugby at at Cal State Chico. Um, And you've competed at the highest levels in powerlifting. Um, yeah, I actually you know, forgot about that, but yeah, <laughs> animal. So, so do you remember the first time that you like really realized that you were faster and stronger than all your, all your buddies? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, so it's very, so that was, it's, it's a very objective thing. Um, you know, that's, it's not, it's not something I was aware of. I was told I was, so I didn't really think that I was faster or anything like that. Um, you know, like my parents would say something like I'd had like friends say something, but there was, you know, I, there were, there were certain things in high school where people would compete to either like be the, like lift 75 pounds more than your body weight. And I was the first to do that, like in my grade. And I'm, I'm not the biggest, you know, I'm, like when I did, I think I was like 110 pounds lifting like almost 200 pound bench press or something. Wow. So things like that were, you know, it's like, oh, okay, now I'm strong. But then when I was fast is, you know, when you're in high school, freshman, sophomore, like there's going to be seniors and stuff like that. They're going to be just because they're more mature. Um, it was probably when I was a junior and, you know, I'm going up like, you know, I was doing varsity track as a sophomore, but then, you know, you get on the relay teams and then even with football, you know, there was certain things that stood out and it was, you know, the coach who was kind of a a rough guy finally acknowledged that, you know, the only person that can run past anybody was me. Like there wasn't anyone else there. I don't know if he was talking about like running better routes or moves or something, but I remember he started screaming at the team and he's like, only he can do that. Like, and I was like, Oh, okay. So, you know, that's when it really stood out. But, but I, you know, I kind of knew, but I didn't really grasp that concept, you know, quickly. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, then it starts like after that, then it's like pretty black and white, like you're fast, you're strong. Like there's really no, you know, kind of in between. That, with that's, a, that's a good feeling when a, when a kind of quiet and strong coach calls, calls you out in front of the whole team. That's amazing. Yeah. I don't know. If it was, I don't remember if it was a good thing or bad thing, but I just remember <laughs> that sentence. And I remember kind of where I was, like where on the, like where we were, where we were on the field. I don't remember what happened prior. But yeah, no, he was a um, successful coach, but he was, uh, you know, kind of rough and, you know, hard on, really hard on everybody. So, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. My, my dad was a, a high school hockey coach. So that's, I think, how everybody remembers him, too. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, you can't, do, like, nowadays, like, the stuff that we would be put through, and you can't do that anymore. You know, no. like, <laughs> you can't like the stuff like that, you know, it, it's just, it's just a different world nowadays, oh, which yeah. is kind of sad. 
my my dad had to retire because like I, I we me and my brothers told him like dude you're gonna get fired <laughs> oh yeah yeah like pre-social media you know you you got away with a lot you know i remember we would practice like literally at the heat of the day and and you know it's a hundred something degrees three times a day like you know just the swearing like none of that stuff would fly there'd be some kid with a phone like recording it and then they get you know you can't do that anymore you got to be careful hundred percent hundred percent so this is a tough one because like if somebody asked me this i have so many what do you think what do you think of as like your favorite mem- memory from playing sports me yeah oh um i so i would say my favorite you know, that that's that's a hard question. I, I would say the thing that I felt was most accomplished and probably favored was, you know, going like as a senior in high school, you know, I'm in the Bay Area, have heavily populated area, you know, and there's, you know, like five star athletes everywhere is being able to, you know, make the state meet and track and then even just conference finals in the short sprints. Um, just because like that there was a you know there's there's a lot to go through and and a lot to try to get to that point and that was kind of like a big watermark just in in the state um in general so i'd say that that's like you know i look back as far as you know if you look at start to finish like what i wanted to do you know at the beginning of the year and see it play out you know it, it might not be like you know the the best like you know scoring a bunch in a rugby game or you know, lifting all this weight, but that was, I would say probably, you know, you know, when you set a goal and, and go in to say, I want to do this and I accomplish that goal. Yeah. So, that, that, and that's an unbelievable talent pool to, to be up against and accomplish that. Um, yeah. There's yeah. Quite, quite a lot of athletes, you know, I remember it was, I looked back, not, I mean, I, I don't know when, but I look back like the, the people that were, you know, the top sprinters, you know, maybe top 10, like I think seven of them, you know, either play like NFL or something like that. And then I'm sitting here, you know, me and like a couple other guys that, that just, we, we weren't like, you know, D1 going to Miami, you know, in, the, in their heyday, like there was a, quite a few guys like that. So it was, you know, looking back, I was like, okay, that was, that was pretty good to kind of, you know, keep up with people like that. I, I, um, so I play golf now, which I consider like kind of an individual pursuit. And I, when yeah. I think it's, when I think a track, I think of it being, you know, it's there, especially with like relay, it's obviously there's, there's team aspects to it, but it is kind of more of an individual pursuit. And then obviously rugby and football, clearly yeah. team sports, like how's a guy like you who does both, how do you approach those two things differently? Um, so I would, I, I think of it this way is, is those are high risk sports, whether it's physical or mental, like there's a very fine line of, you know, like if you're golfing, it's an individual sport, but there's, you know, the risk of injury is low, you know, you can kind of make up for lost ground. If you had a bad hole with short sprints, it's like, it's very, it's very objective. Like if I have a bad start, or, you know, I don't transition well, or I didn't do something like the whole, everything is, is dead. It's dead. Like the complete race is, is done for you. It's very hard, you know, when you have that little time to do that. And when you look at football and rugby, it's, you know, mistakes are, can be very dangerous to you. You know, you can get hurt. I've seen horrific injuries happen, like very close, like right in front of my face, like, you know, very bad injuries. And it's just, you know, it, like I've, it's more of, you know, am I putting myself in the right position to succeed, not get hurt, avoid risk and things like that? So, you know, it's probably more of, of that. But, you know, I, I do like the individual aspect of, of track and, and lifting because, you know, with team sports, there's there's always favoritism. Um, you know, and in high school, like I was not a favorite, like even though if you look like on paper, you know, height, weight, speed, strength, like they would you should have just gravitated and said, okay, we got to do something there, but that's, that's not the case. There's, there's favoritism. And and with those with lifting and track, it's, you know, they can't, they couldn't say like, you're not fast or or, you didn't do this. Like it was very just cut and dry. 
did, did you find that that track was more fulfilling because of that? Yeah, no, de- no, definitely. I mean, I would say that just preparing and before you race, like I, you know, I never got that feeling with rugby or track or football. Like I never got like I was, you know, I guess you get anxious, but not like nervous. Like there, there, it's a different level of you know, I guess thoughts that go through your head is, you know, it's very just because it's you. So that's the only thing that I would say that that got like, you know, your mind kind of in that, like shifted to, okay, like, I really need to focus. I have to be like on my game. Um, Because, like I said, you can't just like, there's so much, you know, with a short sprint, like, you know, 0.1 seconds is like 10 feet, and you're done. Like, so you can't have, you know, mistakes. Yeah, it's it's very you versus you. Uh, yeah, in, in those individual sports. Um, yeah, on the on the rugby side. So um, I would love to hear, like, if we got all your teammates together from '04 from your rugby team, how, how would they describe you? Do you think? Uh, probably fast, strong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know, dramatic. Who knows? But there's a. Uh, You know, it was like when I came on to rugby, it was, you know, I got hurt in track. Like, you know, I felt the coach kind of was short sighting me and I was like, okay, like I'm done. I'm not going to make the Olympics. But, you know, I went out just, I got pulled out and I immediately started playing with like the first team, but it wasn't in a position I wanted, but I just didn't like being on. I didn't want like my, I'm like, I I should never be on B side because I, you know, I'm fast, I'm strong, you know, I'm big. Like, there's no way. So I was like, just put me anywhere where I can play, like, now. And so I was playing, like, basically a position that somebody with speed probably never, ever played. I might be the only person. But, you know, so that that's kind of it. It's like, you know, I, you know, fast, strong. You know, I, I like to party in, in college a lot. Like, we would go out all the time. So... Yeah, r- rugby has a, uh, has a very similar culture to hockey. It's like... Yeah. Let's let's get this practice and game over so we can start yeah. drinking, right? <laughs> well, yeah, it's yeah, it came like so, the, and that was like with track, that was a job, like, and and it made it like high school was fun, college it was not fun. It was like it was very regimented. I was there a lot, like I was overtrained, which was another problem, like you know, and I had really good coaching, like away from college. And so it was, it was such a big difference that it, it was just like, not fun. Like I couldn't go like take a break and hang out on the pole vault mats or, you know, like, take my shirt off and tan. Like I couldn't do all that stuff that I was doing before where with rugby, it was, you know, you can't beat yourself up every day. So there was like conditioning days, practice days. And then it was like, well, let's go out. Like, let's go out to the bars. Let's go to this person's house. Let's get a keg. And so I was like, okay, this is much more my style because I could go out and like, you know, it's like immediately after it's like, that's where it went. It's like, where's the party? You know, and if you didn't have like, it was always prepared. So it was good. That is awesome. Um, and, and much more fun. Yeah. And I, and I know like you, you kind of transitioned on the rugby side into coaching and I've done the same in hockey. Yeah. Um, what what made you want to coach? Was it your own experiences? Uh, I actually got the rugby community. You know, now is it's grown quite a bit. Like when I when I was younger, there wasn't an opera. There was maybe one youth team that I know of. Looking back, but now it's much more prevalent across schools. And there's just some guy that knew. I didn't know him, but he either saw me play, knew my name, read about it or something. And he would just pursue me like on LinkedIn. He's like, you know, this is your hometown. It's a team. It wasn't there. Like you did this and that. Like, like, I know you played here. I know you did this. And he was just on me to come out. And so I showed up and I said, okay, like, fine. Like, in the, you know, I'm like, all right, I'll, I'll show up. And they wanted me to work with like the high school boys. And they, like the first day they didn't listen to anything I said, like not a single thing. And I'm like, forget it. And so then they're like, well, what about the girls? And then there's one guy coaching the girls and I was like, okay. And they listened much more. So and I'm like, okay, well, you know, maybe I can translate some of the things I learned. You know, I was around a lot of good players. I met a lot of 
friends and people and got to travel around for a couple of years after college and be able to kind of translate that knowledge, you know, where I can, I can more look down on the game rather than have to play it. Cause I, I felt like, you know, when I played, you know, like I would just try to score, like I'm fast. That's the position. Like I would just go and I just would get very focused on that where in coaching, you know, I, I felt like I understood the game, but I could talk to the players much more about strategy you know, experience, like what to look for. So that's what I, I liked about it. Yeah, it is. It is an interesting experience going from being in the game to like almost on yeah. the game and like seeing that different perspective. And it, I think it's really good when guys like you and me get, get back involved in, in the youth game, because I think it's so important to give back. Right. Yeah. Um, so that's awesome. I, you know, our, our big thing, we always, we're lucky. We get to, we get to work with athletes as they're going through a really hard time, which is the transition period, right? Like yeah. you kind of have your identity your whole life. And then one day it's just gone and it do really doesn't matter when it happens. I'm, I'm curious to know, like, from your perspective, what do you, what do you remember about the transition from being an athlete to going into like being a working professional? You know, it was, it was hard. Um, you know, I, I, I had a lot of people that were, you know, were help would help me to get a job. So I had like some, you know, level of support, but it was, what do I want to do? You know, what, where should I spend, spend my time? And like the one thing that I don't think prepares anybody, you know, especially athletes is, you know, you're going straight from, you know, socializing, you know, school, free time, workouts, et cetera, like all these things that you've habitually done for a period of years to, you know, and this is like 2005, like straight, like a nine to five job, you know, I was handling insurance claims and I'm just listening to like miserable people lie on the phone and say, I got hurt when they did not I'm just like, this is just not good. And then I wanted to go out. Like, I was like, I want to go out still. Like my friends, like we all still wanted to go and socialize. So it was like finding that balance. And then, you know, I didn't last very long at that job, but, you know, and then I started to use like your network and someone I played rugby with was working at a gym is like, Hey, like, you know how to do all this stuff. He was actually someone I was powerlifting with even before then. And so I went to go work with him and, you know, it allowed me, cause I was still, you know, playing rugby and, you know, you're, you're hitting like a high level just with like, club like the highest level in rugby here and so it's like okay like you know can i do anything here can i you know can i take it the step further is there anything there so i was able to still kind of work out and have a job so i was like that was a good transition but it wasn't like the the typical transition i took a i took kind of a long way to get into the industry i'm in now like five six years and then grad school before i started to get in just because you know it's, it's not easy. It's not easy to find a job. It's not easy to find people that want to hire you. Uh, especially nowadays, Every, everything is, is who, you know, and you know, if you don't have like a good stepping stone on what you want to do prior to even graduating, where that someone sits down and maybe talks with you and helps mentor or kind of shift, you know, right after graduation, rather than jump right into a job immediately, which is what I did. Yep. So good, you, good use of the word shift there. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, that's it's, it's well thought out there. <laughs> when, when did you, um, when did you first become aware of and like kind of interested in a, in a sales career, Victor? So I, when I started working at the gym, it was sales. Like I was having to sell personal training, you know, fitness supplements type stuff. Yep. And, you know, when the, yeah, you know, I did well, excuse me, got promoted, things like that. And and it became more of, you know, you're selling like memberships, fitness, like anything going on in the facility. And so I, I was around a lot, like probably some of the sales that I learned is from people there, because th this is like, it was very high pressure, same day sales, like, you know, very certain ways of having to go about to like extract, you know, a couple thousand dollars on someone that just walks in the door. Like, like that's a very, I thought it was much harder than what I'm doing now. And so from there I was like, okay, you know, 
And I remember I was thinking it's, you know, I'm like 25 or something and you don't see anybody that's old in the gym, like running a gym. If they are, they're kind of just, you know, I don't know. They don't, they don't much drive or that that's kind of all that they want to do. So I was like, I don't know if I can, you know, be 40 or 45 and like working in the gym. And I was trying to get in out of the industry to try to go into like do tech or something like more formal and nobody would hire me like nobody it was just like i was labeled as just a retail guy so you know it was it's like it was very hard to have like these skills and be able to close and sell that i knew other people wouldn't be able to do because it's very like you know it, it was very hard to do that and then no one wanted to take a chance with you just because like you know, I ran a facility, like I was a general manager at a gym. They're just like, well, you're retail. Yeah. Just, I would just get brushed off. So what, which is, which is wild, right? Like I think yeah. that, I think that perspective is, has changed a lot and is changing a lot more. Um, but we have a long way to go before these old school sales leaders really understand that, you know, experience isn't, you know, necessarily just people that have used salesforce.com and like, yeah. you know, cold called IT directors, right? There's other experience that matters significantly. And a, and a couple thousand dollar transactional sale in 15 minutes is pretty meaningful yeah. when you need to go get meetings with people. Uh, oh, and I, yeah, it drove me, it drove me, it drove me nuts. And so when I became a manager, I hired people that either they would either have like an athletic background or they had a background like that. Like yeah. they, you know, like I had a couple guys that I hired that ran enterprise rent a cars like oh, yeah. the facilities and those guys, it's like, and, and not just the sales part, it's, you know, responsibility. P &L. And yep. it's like athletes had responsibilities and then you had these guys that were running other facilities that had those responsibilities. So it's like where, you know, if you're just someone that just kind of meanders through school and you just get a job, it's like, I, I don't, I, I, I couldn't relate to that. Like I, I, it was, it was very, like, I didn't like, like there's people that stood out obviously, but for the most part, like I was looking for people that had like real experience, real responsibility. And those are kind of like the only places that I could find it. Yep. Absolutely. So, what, what, like we, we, as I said, we, we work with a lot of transitioning athletes. Funny enough, a lot of folks coming out of the gym industry. Uh, we just yeah. worked, worked with a personal trainer. She's like at a lifetime, been selling kind of her services. We got, she's got an awesome job. Um, for like, you know, our listeners, what, what type of guidance would you give them when they are d making that transition from sports to sales? Like, what would be your biggest piece of advice for them? Um, I, I think the biggest piece of advice is they have to, you know, I, I think athletes always taught to be humble and, you know, not brag or things like that. Like, like, so, you know, and I, I remember I was interviewing people and there's a guy that played in the NFL and he didn't want to talk about it. And it's like, I get it, you know, but you know, you need to like, that's, that's a, that's a big accomplishment. You know, what, what all went behind there? And, and that's something that they should focus on. Like if they're in the gym trying to sell personal training, it's how did they get there? What experience do they have? They, they have to go in and talk about when I was doing this, I had to be here at this time. I had to do this at this time. I had school. I had this. I had that. I had to do this. And then when I went into this industry, I had to go through all these different metrics. I had to do all these different things organizationally to show that one, you're driven, you're organized, and you can meet goals. And that's the biggest thing. And I think that people, they get into interviews and they just kind of, they, they hold back. And I, I would say is like, if, if anyone asks, like if I was talking to someone that was whatever sport and they say, Hey, I want to do that. I, I would absolutely say like, you need to sell them on you and sell them on the why. And then, ask for like close them on the job like ask them you know did i do everything i need is there any reservation like all those closing questions to be able to move it to the next step and you have to close on those interviews um and i think that if if they take their experience and then the confidence that they have just going through you know an athletic program or jobs like that is to be able to kind of say hey like i can do this job what's next and push 
I, I love that. I think it's it's really good interview advice, right? It's like, yeah. listen, you you got to learn how to tell your story in the context of a sales role, right? You came back from an injury, who gives a sh- you know, and and yeah. and you played. You're g- not going to care if somebody says no to you a thousand times. Like that's going to be fine. Like y- you know, the resiliency factor, the competitive factor, um, you know, all that yeah. stuff. You got to get comfortable talking about yourself and and it's not just those stories it's then tying those stories back to the role i think is yeah. is is really what makes an a plus interview from a former athlete yeah and when it comes to sales i think that that's the easiest move that they would have is you know if you take all the things that you've done with sports regardless of what level it's you know you've had coaching probably more so than other people You've had goals that you've had to accomplish. You've had to put work in outside of maybe just practice. Like you've had to do a diet or you had to go on the gym on your own. So there's lots of things that you can tie into, or you've had responsibility. Like if you, you were a captain or you had a certain expertise on the team, like maybe like you were having to help others on the team that on something and be able to kind of take that experience and say, you know, I did this. And this is the goal. This is this is the outcome, and just be able to translate that. Like one interview question that when I was a hiring manager, I would ask is just tell me something you've done start to finish. Like I set a goal, did it, and I, I probably nine out of ten people couldn't tell me a single thing. And it was like all these things that they would start and they never finish. They'd start and they never finish. And I would just like, you know, I would start off with that question and be like, okay, well, let's not waste each other's time. You know, you know, this isn't the right fit. A hundred percent. So it's taking, it's taking, you know, those experiences and not, you know, don't minimize that stuff. Like, and that's, you know, I've seen too many people minimize, you know, things like that. It's like, well, it's not like, like I was playing baseball. It's not this, it's not the same. It's like, well, make it like, make it similar, you know, yeah. talk about, you know, take the word baseball out, but all the prep, all of this you know, all these other tangible things, like talk about that stuff. Absolutely. hundred percent. And, and, and then remember that too, when you're in the role, right? Like it's like, you know, it's going to be hard. It's going to be complex. You're going to learn new stuff, but you've been there before. It was just athletically. Now it's, now it's more, you know, industry specific. Um, so, so early, early in your career, um, you know, I look back, I have, I have some regrets of like how I handled things at the beginning. What what are some uh some of the things you'd do differently if you had the chance from the early days of your your sales career? You know, I you know, I it, I was I don't want to say um you know, weak with certain things, but I was almost, you know, I wasn't firm in what I wanted to do or what I wanted done like with sales like if Like I I wanted to be like too much of a team player, like where somebody would want an account for me, or I knew somebody at some, at some organization that I thought I could get a sale, but someone else was working. And I was very kind of, you know, Hey, like, I'll just be a team player. Like, you know, this will work out and being able to, you know, go back and just be firm with what you want, why you want it and not have it be like outrageous stuff. It's like, but I think with sales, is the people that have been around a long time like they will find you know they they sniff stuff out they can find like they're just like you get very cunning with what you know where you know be able to kind of jump over people and especially when it comes to commission based you know everyone's fighting for the dollar so i would think it's like you know be firm with what you know if you know something if you want to do something if there's anything like that to be go back and say hey you know I need to be more firm. I need to be, you know, real regimented and demand certain things like professionally, you know, I want to work that account. Here's why, you know, not just, or if someone says, Hey, I want to do, take this from you. If there's no good reason, say no. And just be firm, draw that line in the sand because it's very like any or every organization, there's always somebody's trying to get an edge. Like someone's trying to, you know, sneak around. Like it's just, you know, sales. And, you know, there's always going to be people like that. And I was just very, you know, I didn't want to, you know, rock the boat. 
And yep. I think if you stand up for yourself, you know, early on, that's going to set the stage. People will just leave you alone after that. Cause then it's like, Hey, like, what about this one? Or, Hey, like I, like, Hey, I know someone here. And you know, it's like, maybe I know someone there. It's like, you know, that's my account. So there's a lot of that. So that's what I would say. It might not be the, uh, you know, what everyone else has talked about, but you know, when you get into sales and it has to, you're heavily commission based and there's a lot of effort that goes into finding leads, finding opportunities, closing deals. Like you, you have to, you have to draw your lines. You have to say, this is okay. This is not okay. Um, you know, I want this and here's why, and be able to kind of outline those things and stick to it. Yeah. What I find a lot is, is it's, it's really about advocating for yourself. And and what happens a lot is that doesn't, people don't get comfortable doing that till later in their career. But if you can start to do that early and build that muscle, it's going to pay off in the long run, especially when you want to climb the, climb the corporate ladder. Um, Yeah. They don't want to, they they don't want to make, you know, it's, it's much easier just to kind of be passive about it and just draw, like be, be firm, you know, be confident. And those things will, especially early, early in your career, it's a good reputation to have. It is. It is. Um, so you made the switch over more kind of to the tech space. What what were yeah. some of the things you focused on early on to kind of make sure you had a, a solid foundation? You had had success in the gym industry. Now you want to do the same thing in, in this new industry. What were some of those things you focused on early on? So it was sales is sales. Uh, I don't think that there's, you know, obviously you have to know what, like what your product is, what your company does. Like, you know, you have to know that, like you have to know, you know, your industry and things like that. But in the end, it's, I still relate everything back to when I was, you know, selling personal training, you know, cause that was like my foundation in sales is if I couldn't get people to picture themselves either getting in shape, going through a program, or even now, like, you know, using the technology, solving their problems, you know, fixing whatever issues they have. If that picture is not painted, they will never buy. Like, it's just, you know, if you're just going through the motions, it has to be personal, like not personal. Like I'm, you know, there's obviously the relationship involved. Like, you know, they, people buy from people. They, they, you know, if they don't like you, they're not going to buy, even if you have the best product, but it's, can you structure, you know, your discovery calls or your initial conversation, extract the information and then be able to kind of take it from there and say, based on what you said, this is the desired outcome. This is how you'll get there. This is how it works with me or with us and be able to kind of paint that picture, you know, talk about customers that are similar, talk about people that are similar and be able to kind of get that mindset where they can say, hey, like I can see myself doing that, or hey, like, yeah, I see you fixing that problem, or I see us being better in this area. And so it's just, it's the same, like to me, it's the same talk, it's the same talk track. It's just, you know, instead of selling, you know, weight loss or muscle gain or performance, it's, you know, I'm selling technology for various reasons. And you're here for a reason. What's the reason? And try to get that. So. I, I like how you put that. It it really is about painting a picture of like what life is like after, right? And 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 honestly, yeah. what the negative consequences of not changing are, right? Like yeah. this is what life's gonna be like if you decide not to do this, right? So it is there yeah. is a ton of parallels there. Um super curious to get your take on this because we we deal with it a lot. Um, you know, and I don't I'm I'm your age. I don't want to be like the old guy yelling at clouds, but you yeah. know, we get we get a lot of candidates that get, you know, they usually get multiple offers because right, we're not doing any exclusive agreements. We don't do retainer. You know, when we get a candidate, we're usually putting them in front of multiple opportunities. And yeah, you know, a lot of the candidates we work with nowadays are looking at, you know, the usual stuff, right? What's the base salary? What's the variable comp? What's the benefits? A big, a big thing now is you know, office versus remote. Um, So these are the kind of things that they're considering when they pick that first company. Mm -hmm. What do you think is missing on that list? And and how would you advise a person that's brand new to the technology space to evaluate the potential employers that we're putting them in front of? 
So one thing I started doing, excuse me, probably, you know, not that long ago was if, if I didn't think I could, so t- think of, you know, comp, all that stuff that you mentioned, but who are you going to work for? I, I, I always wanted to know like who the manager is, who the VP of sales was, like why, like, and I would ask questions about that to either the hiring manager or recruiter, because I wanted to get a sense for, for that person. And the reason why is like, are they jumping around a lot or, you know, and some I've even, I had one person say like, yeah, he's not that great, you know, but the package is so good. And I was like, well, you know, I didn't like that. And I think people just run to the money, but the other side is like, can I learn anything from this person? Like, are they going to benefit me in any way? Like, is there something that I'm going to learn from this guy or this girl that's going to, that I can use in my career. Like, are they going to be all over me because they're a new manager and they don't know what they're doing? Have they had success in multiple areas? So just like how, you know, when, I mean, maybe it's like, as you get later stage, like most of like, especially in my industry, everybody knows each other. And so they do, you know, they're going to go, Hey, we got this guy and they're going to go circle around the wagon and find out who knows me, who knows you find out stuff about them. And then the other side is you need to do that on them. You need to find out who you're going to work for. Cause if they're a nightmare, but they have a great comp, like you're going to be in and out or you're going to hate your life. So it's, you know, tell me about the manager. Tell me about VP. Like what's their background? Like, why do people like them? Like maybe talk to try to talk to a rep on the team and just get a sense for what that environment's going to look like. Cause if it's in the office, but they're, you know, really like they're, they're cool. Like they're there to help. Like they're, you know, you enjoy working with them is much different than if you're remote and someone's asking you, what did you do? What did you do? You know, send me a report. And when they're going through motion like that, it's, you know, even if you're not there, it's going to be a nightmare for you. I absolutely love that answer. We're going to cut that thing up, make it a requirement. Cause literally that's exactly what I tell our, our candidates. I'm like the the number yeah. one most important thing, especially for your first job, is who you work for, because that is good. That's going to be the person that sets your foundation and the way you yeah. view this industry from the get go. Um, yeah, I, I love that answer. Um, I saw Victor. You you've spent most of your career in like the conference conferencing collaboration space. I, you know, I grew yeah. up initially selling. You know, this is way back, like Cisco, like WebEx. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I did too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How, how did you how did you end up in that in that space? It's 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 a little different than like the straight ahead like enterprise IT software that's like solving some infrastructure problem. Yeah, like, like tell me a little bit about that. Well, so I I knew people there, so I I got in through you know, relationships and being referred in. Uh, that's how I got in there. But, you know, at the time, you know, if you look back, you know, 2010 or whatever, when this was, is that was kind of cutting edge technology was like web conferencing and things like that, where it was always, there was always an, like, I could sell it to most any companies because either it was too expensive with someone else that they're using and I could help them reduce costs or I could, like introduce it, you know, widespread and and there could be more collaboration, but it wasn't just, it was, you know, the company was, got their name on pretty much like audio conferencing, operator assisted calls, like earning calls, things like that. But we also had a lot of other buckets that we sold. You know, we had network, we had telephony, we had webcasting. So there's a lot of different solutions there. So you know, when I got in, it's like, okay, like I can learn a lot of things. And one of the people I knew prior to taking that said that, you know, and she ended up kind of like, she told me she was, she was there for like four or five years. She was, she's like, Hey, I'm going to get a, I'm getting a better job, but working here, I had to learn like five different products and five different solutions and all these different things where in typical tech, it's like, you have one thing like they're selling you know starps like we do one thing and we focus on one thing but i had you know kind of this and and i like that idea of being able to kind of be well versed across multiple technologies yeah 
a hundred, a hundred percent. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm curious, like, uh, so, so I think you're our first guest that's been a channel sales manager. I grew up in the channel and I know that conferencing software is very heavily sold through channel partners. So for, and we're starting to get a little bit more into that space now, but for people who don't know what any of that means, can, can you just like quickly explain like what a channel really is and, and what like your role is compared to a normal kind of like direct to business, uh, sales, sales job. So I was direct up until about a month ago. So I, I, I was a direct seller for, you know, 10, 12, 13 years. Yep. And what I learned just across the way is like, there's different routes to market, you know, there's marketing and it, and it, speaking from like a sales perspective, like sales in general, you'll get marketing leads, you'll have outbound leads and maybe a BDR, someone sources. So there's different w- ways that you're going to get your opportunities. And with conferencing, collaboration, network, data center, SD-WAN, contact center, which is what I'm in now, there's a lot of referral, reseller type arrangements that these companies have where, you know, there's value added resellers, there's consultants. And that's who I work with now is being able to make sure that, you know, when they're going to companies and they're talking about their services and how they consult, what they do, where they have expertise, that when push comes to shove, when there is an evaluation that's going to take place, that we get included and how strong we are with that partner, how much they know about us, how, how well they like us, they know why we're different. So that's a, that's a big route to market is being able to use referrals, relationships, and you know, subsequently they, they get comped for referring that business to us. So it can be very lucrative for people in the industry, like independent contractors. So, you know, and if you look back at old school telephony, 20 years ago, all that stuff was sold through a third party supported by a third. A lot of that stuff was, it was very, you know, just tons of that. And those people are still around. They still have relationships because in this industry, like the bigger deals, they've all, they all know somebody like they work with a consultant. They work with like a carousel, a CDW, WW2, some of these really big agencies and kind of outsourcing, um, providers and we need to have relationships with them otherwise we're not going to get invited to the table um when i was with ring central it was like above a certain threshold in sales size it was a hundred percent channel driven like channel driven meaning it was referred to us we sold it with a partner or we got a lead from a partner so there's there's always that involvement. So it, it's a big growing route to market even today. Like it's still growing. There's still a lot of a lot of work to be done. If if companies get the channel right, it is a complete game changer. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Like you're you're accelerating you're you're accelerating sales cycles, you're getting to power faster. Um, you're skipping the paperwork process. Yep. Like there's so many, there's so much goodness there. And I, and I think, you know, coming from, you know, growing up in, in more of the venture backed world, sometimes VCs can struggle with that because it's yep. hard to, it's hard to measure what an impact of like a partner that's been working with a customer for 20 years actually means to your deals. You can't see yeah. that on a spreadsheet, but you can see conversion rates for BDR calls, right? So yeah. it is, It is. I think it's unbelievable, but it is hard for organizations to really wrap their arms around it. Um, no, it, it is. And if it's not tracked, if, if you can't track, like if you do an event or if there's a meet, if there's some, there's always events, like there's golfing, there's hat. So there's always some sort of networking event. And being able to tie what took place there back to an opportunity, I mean, there's if, if that's if we're able to do that, there's a lot of ROI. And then if you look at how the economy, if the economy goes bad, channels even more important because you know we're not like we're not paying them until something gets sold. You know, we don't pay for the lead or refer like we don't compensate any of our partners until that's a, a closed done deal. 
So, you know, it's, it's very important to us to make sure that, that they're, that it's right, that they're supported, that they, they know who we are, why we're different and that we're easy to work with. A hundred percent. Um, uh, so a big, a big part of like why we started the company and, and like just in our overall mission is like, we, we believe mentorship is really important, right? Yeah. Um, can you just talk about like any, any colleagues, peers, leaders that have been valuable mentors to you and, and what you learned from them? Yeah. So it's, you know, there was, there was a guy, um, you know, I'm, I'm speaking just in, just in tech. So there's a guy that I met, you know, just on a, like a trip, like it was a work trip. It was like an incentive trip, but, you know, being able to have a mentor just while I was kind of getting on board with the company and being able to talk to somebody candidly. And I think that's important. It's candidly, like you need somebody that has done something that you've done similar that you can speak to like a normal person where you don't have to worry about, Hey, can I say this or that? Like you have to talk to them like a normal person and being able to kind of hear their experience, get advice, like things that you, maybe you don't want to bring your manager. Maybe you don't want to like talk about on the team call. Like that stuff's very important. Like I kept in touch with that guy for many years. I saw him rant, like, you know, we didn't talk for a while. I saw him randomly show up in like our office once and, you know, things like that are very important. You know, and then as I've grown, there's been, you know, a couple managers that have helped me out, people that I keep in touch with now where, you know, they might be at, at competitors, they might be doing something different. But, you know, when push comes to shove, if, if you're coming across an issue, you need advice. There's always like they will be there to help. They will give, you know, you can talk to them, you can get good insight. And so there, you don't want to have too many of them. Um and one thing I've, I've always said is I've learned more from like really bad managers more than anybody else. But it's, you know, how do I navigate this? What do you think about this? Like, hey, I'm interviewing here. What do you think? Do you know anybody? Like all that stuff is important. Or, hey, like, wh like what did you do? Like what, what worked or what didn't work? Like what's like, what are you guys struggling with? Like, you know, and being able to kind of have those conversations help. So, you know, there's peers there's there's leaders so it's not like a to me there there hasn't been like one person where that's the guy throughout my entire career like i've, I've tried to you know make sure that there's you know and even one of the guys that you know is probably a mentor that helps me out he used to work for me you know so it doesn't have to be you know someone that's above me someone that's a peer you know he's obviously doing well somewhere else but you know one point in his career like he was my employee, but there's a lot of insight. There's a lot of value that he has. And, you know, we still talk. I, I think your point of getting someone to, to run stuff by outside of your org is really important, right? Like I, yeah. I found, you know, looking back early in my career, I was a high achieving individual contributor. And my, my only mentor really was like my, my boss. And when you're a high achieving individual yeah. contributor, he's not going to tell you like, Hey, you should get into management because he's going to lose like 40% of his revenue that oh, yeah, you're dropping for him. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah, no, that, that, that's, a, that's a whole nother topic, yeah. you know, but, <laughs> but yeah, no, it, it's true. It's like, so, you know, if you have a manager, you can, that's great. But most of the time, you know, if you want career advice or what to do. Maybe you got a job that sucks and you're like, I just started here two months ago. Like, I don't know what to do. There's lots of people. You just, you have to, you know, and I think, you know, athletes have a better, they're around a lot of, I'll say diverse people, diverse backgrounds, like with sports, like, you, like these people come from every walk of life. Like they're just good. Like you're good at something, they're good at something. And then you're on the same team. And so like having perspective, that's not somebody that's just like you is good too. Like you, you gotta, you gotta branch out. Um, and I think athletes are pretty good at that because, they, you know, if you're on a team, you got to break the ice somehow with somebody, you know, if you're going to be around them a bunch. So, you know, that's something for them to highlight. That, that's such a good point. Like the only thing you typically have in common with someone is that you both excel at this one sport, yeah. but you grew up differently. Your parents are different. Like everything else is different. It's such a good yeah. point. Very yeah. similar to being on a sales team. Um, yeah. So, so two closing questions for you, Victor. We ask sure. every, every uh, guest answers these. Um, 
we always want to know like one skill that you've developed that has made you elite in your career. What, what's your, like, what's your number one skill you think? Um, that makes me elite is I would say at this point in my career, I'm very good at networking and being able to kind of flush out opportunities just through, you know, people that I know or things that I read and be able to tie that back. Like I got very good at, you know, being organized in that fashion. Like that's probably my elite skill is, you know, I can look at something, I can dissect it fast. I can find who knows who, where is something going on in there and just kind of like tying all that stuff together, I think is very hard for sellers and just in general it's you know how can you connect the dots where you go into a meeting and i'm sorry this isn't channel this is just sales is we go you know when you go through like a quarterly review and you talk about your deals and there's lots of different factors that go into it and good sales leadership will ask those questions and being able to kind of have that ready not a lot of people do it it's like who knows who what do they do? Why, you know, why are they, you know, why are they talking to you? Why do you think it's going to close? Like all these different things and, and be able to tie that together. And a lot of that you have to do through, you know, I'll say like just network. You got to talk to people. You got to ask the right questions. You got to make things personal. So that kind of structure within the sales, you know, organization is 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 very important so that's probably the skill that i had that i would think that is is you know better than others is be able to organize a sale start to finish i like um, that but you know it's if there if there's a number two it would uh i think i'm actually i don't know there's not a number two that's that's it <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mentioned, uh, you know, growing up playing hockey, we, we, me and my brothers used to get hammered, you know, like with the same kind of idea where like, there's a lot of people that play hockey, but there's only a certain group of people that are hockey players. So like this yeah. idea of like professionalism and being a pro, right. And, and we, and I think the highest praise you can give a salesperson is calling them a pro. What, what yeah. does, what does being a pro mean to you as a salesperson? Well, you know, going back to, to skills, it's, you know, being a pro can, is also you have to be coachable. You know, that that's a big aspect that sellers and, and athletes need to have is because it's not like if you're doing, you know, a very siloed job, like if you're in accounting, you know, that that's that's not like there's n probably not as many moving parts that you have, like when you're dealing with an actual human trying to sell them something. So being coachable, you know, if, if you can like the pros are all, you know, there's obviously the exceptions, but I'd say most professional athletes have to be coached. Like they, they, they have to have a good coach. They have to listen to that coach. They have to be receptive to that coach. And that's one thing is be able to take that feedback, use it and grow and apply it. And I think that when you're a pro and someone gives you, you got to do this or do that, like they can you know, talk about it, they can think about it, and then they can go apply it. And I think that that's like real pro, like professionalism. I love it. It's, it, it is all about coachability. It's like, look at Steph Curry's out there, you know, yeah. shooting, shooting all day, every day. Right. And he's the best yeah. in the world. That continuous coachability is definitely a key attribute for a pro. Well, yeah, said. he has, he has a, yeah, he has a shooting coach. Like, you know, it's like, there's always something, you know, yeah. and a lot of these coaches, you know, they might not have been the best player, but they can apply and they can teach them. And I think with sales, it's, you know, I think promote always promoting the, the top ranked salesperson is, is a bad idea because can they teach someone else how to do that? Can they do that? And usually it's just, you know, like the Michael Jordan analogy, it's like, he's like, that's just, I don't know why you can't do what I can do. Right. Um, and I think that, you know, being successful and being able to either take coaching and, uh, and coach others is, is a big, th that'll really make people differentiate in this industry. 
I love it. Victor, this was an awesome conversation. I know our candidates are going to learn a ton. Thank you so much for, for yeah, giving us your you. time, buddy. I really appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Thanks for the time. Appreciate it. This wraps up this episode of Merchants of Change. If you enjoyed this episode, the most meaningful way to say thanks is to submit a review wherever you listen to podcasts. If you're interested in working with us, please come find us at www.shiftgroup.io.